All right, so a couple things that I just want to talk about right here at the beginning of class. One of the things that I saw people running into as they were doing their retargeting, and I'm not sure if it's going to affect any of you guys in here or not, but if it has, is that within when I was recording the other tutorials, one of the things that I ran into was that I had originally told you to separate the mouth and the jaw into two separate facial groups. And that makes a certain kind of sense, but in practice, I found it to be a little bit limiting because if I um, put the mouth into its own group and I separated the jaw into its own group, it was kind of hard to make mouth shapes convincingly when the jaw was not part of them because they're really intricately related. So there are two things that you could do. The first thing would be to, if you have already separated them like that and you've already gone through and started creating a bunch of poses um, for your retargeting, then the solution, the easiest solution for dealing with that is to make sure that the poses that you've created for the mouth, the frames that they match up on, are the same frames that you've created poses for for the jaw. That way the jaw and the mouth are still opening and moving on the exact same frame. So if you are going to have them as separate um, facial groups, make sure that they are on the same, that the auto poses and the manual poses are on the same frame numbers. So you'll have like frame 229 for the mouth, then you'll have frame 229 for the jaw. And frame 541 for the mouth and frame 541 for the jaw. Right? But if they're on different poses, then it's going to be a little bit harder to really truly get the right result. The alternative to that, which is what I did in the tutorials, which is what I instructed in the, in the tutorials, was to simply say, let's get rid of that jaw group altogether. And I took, on the Amanda rig, I took the three poses, or I said the three controls that were associated with the jaw group, which happened to be the little jaw control by her chin that kind of looks like a, a guitar pick, and then the two teeth controls inside the mouth. Those were the only three controls that I had on the jaw group. I deleted the jaw group, and then I added those three controls into the mouth group. And then I retargeted based on that. Okay? Um, and that works fine. Right? And that to me makes a lot more sense. I never worked, I never actually worked with the separate cheek and jaw uh, groups before. It was just something I was trying for this time around. And I as as usual, sometimes when you're experimenting around with things, you find that things work better or worse in certain situations. In this case, I just felt that it was better to do it keeping those two groups together at the very least. OK, um, a couple other things that I wanted to mention. Yesterday, as I was working through here, I ran into a number of issues as I was trying to uh, create animation layers. And there were some stability issues that I was running into Maya. Namely, Maya kept crashing. All right, um, I'm sure that you've all experienced Maya crashing. Why does it crash? Various reasons, sometimes because there isn't enough um, there aren't enough resources available. It could be they run out, it runs out of RAM. Uh, it could be that there's not enough space on the hard drive left to write out some temp files, all these sorts of things. Um, but one thing that kind of popped into my head inspirationally was this. If you come into your animation settings at the bottom right where the little guy who looks like he's running away from a gear icon, you will have uh, an option within the actual animation settings itself, settings animation, by default, your evaluation mode is probably set to parallel. Okay? Um, I changed this to DG. I don't know what that stands for. Do good. All right? Um, so I set that to DG, and then I didn't have any instability issues anymore. And I think this sometimes has to do with the nature of either the graphics card that you have or the processor that you have or, or some kind of resource thing. Um, so in this case here, DG seemed to make my life a lot better yesterday. I remember somebody doing that a long time ago on a tutorial somewhere, and it just popped into my head. And I don't remember why. I don't remember how. It just does. All right. Um, OK. So try that. Now, um, another, th another concern around dealing with uh, Retargeter 
is how many auto poses <coughs> should I be creating? How much work should um, I be expecting retargeter to do for me? And what should the result look like? Okay, so <coughs> what's not going here? It's about what's the realistic expectation. Retargeter is going to get you 50 to 60 percent of the way there. Okay, it's going to give you a reasonable result once the retargeting has been, uh, once that retarget button is pressed. Okay, but it's not going to get you all the way there. What's, what it means though is that, uh, just take the mouth for example. The mouth is apt, when you retarget, the mouth is apt to open and close, go wide and narrow, all those sorts of things, but it may not do it to the exact correct amount on the exact right frame. Right? So you may find that if you're trying to make an M sound, right? In order to make an M sound, you have to close your lips. Right? You can't make an M, try it, M, and you can't make an M sound without closing your lips. All right? Um, so what you may find is that in the audio, you, or in the video, you'll see that the actor um, gets their lips fully closed on frame 230. But your character, gets their lips 90% of the way closed, which is the most closed that they get in that frame range, on frame 232, all right? So there's a couple things you'd have to do there. One, later on, you'll have to go and do some cleanup where the lips get fully closed, and you're gonna have to make sure it happens on frame 230 and not 232, because it's really weird to hear somebody make a sound when the visuals don't match up to that sound. And we're very, very, um, we're subconsciously very aware of when something is off, right? Um, so the eyeballs opening and closing, being open the right amounts or closing the right amounts, those are also things that are tend to be um, either overdone or underdone um, in the retargeting, and also late or early, those are all things. And then of course, and there's just some shapes, just overall, I mean, what are the controls that are most important for you to really focus on in terms of your cleanup? Well, if we take a look at my face cam here, which that does not look like my face cam. I don't know what's going on there. Oh, I know why. Okay, it's because I've, um, I've gone in and I've applied mocap data to her, that's why. Let me see if I can find a version of this file that is before I've done this. Give me one second. So I think all this is important for you to realize that um, you're not expecting miracles from this software. Just as with any kind of mocap, it's not miraculous, all right? Um, you get, it gets you a certain way there, but you have to do a lot of work still to clean it up. All right, so if we look at, let's just talk about the mouth since we're looking at the mouth right now. Once the mouth has been uh, retargeted, what are the sections that I should expect to really put a lot of time into the cleanup stage? This is the doing the red nine stuff and then going through bit by bit and if you like watch my tutorials, you'll see me going through and doing the, uh, the real persnickety stuff that takes a long time to make sure that things get held and, and you know, when the mouth is closed, it stays closed over an interval, the frames get, or the, uh, the curves become flat over that range, right? I control all the spacing, I control all of the timing and whatnot in the graph editor. So I start large to small big controls to small controls. So for the, for the mouth region, the thing I would start cleaning up first, manually, and doing a lot of work in, is gonna be the big jaw control, the big open and close control, whatever that happens to be the equivalent of on your character, all right? And then I would move on to the next levels, which would probably be these uh, side controls of the mouth, the width, all right? And I would clean both of those up. And that really means going in to um, the graph editor and actually 
doing true cleanup, not just running red nine on it and saying done, running red nine and then going in and doing the true cleanup. And then from there, it's up to you to decide. It will, if you're doing, a, if you're trying to do it as well as possible, you will likely be going in and working with uh, these three controls at the top and then separately a pass the three controls on the bottom. Um, in this case here, these three controls are so intricately linked together that you kind of have to do all three of them at the same time. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the little bit of the caveat with those ones. So when I'm doing this, if I go into um, my graph editor, <coughs> what you may notice though on any one of these given controls, like that's the center control there, is that there's a lot of channels here, right? So I translate X and translate Y, that makes sense. Translate Z though, that doesn't make any sense because that doesn't control anything in terms of the mouth. That's just like push, like literally pushing toward the, the screen or pushing out from the screen right now. Makes no difference. So translate Z is one I could get rid of. And then all these rotates and scales, they're irrelevant. So what I would do is I would just select all of the channels that I don't need, drag a big selection around the curves and hit delete. And now I'm only looking at the two channels that actually matter. Okay. And I would do that for any of the curves that seem to be not necessary for whatever section of the face you're looking at. All right. So at the very least, I would say the up, down, and left, right controls, basically the chin and the mouth corners, those are the ones you're going to definitely want to do a lot of manual cleanup on. And then, if you have time, definitely then go for these bigger controls here, the six controls around the lips. And then it's up to you. For these ones that are just around the little minor controls around the lips, I might just run red nine on these and hope for the best. Unless there is a, um, you know, unless as I'm watching this back and I can see in my, my video over here, um, there is something missing or there's a shape that seems a bit off then I would want to go in and probably fix that, okay? Um, so yeah, what about the eyes? Let's take a look at the eyes real quick. All right, so for the eyes, um, obviously you're definitely gonna wanna take whatever control you're using for the actual positions, the rotations of the eyes, okay? And as you can see here, with all that cleanup, this is what I would expect cleanup to look like as far as the graph is concerned. Right, so the eyes lock into something, they stay locked on them. Right, there can be a little bit of movement here and there, but overall, um, that's what I would expect. Right, so I start with the, with the eye location, the eye orientation. Then the next ones that I definitely do clean up on are gonna be the upper lid and lower lid controls. Okay, that open and close the lids. So those three, are the absolute musts. And then from there, again, this is when it comes down to if you have time, I would also then be looking at the three that govern the, uh, well at least actually, I would say it's probably more important that the two on either side of that uh, control, of those lid controls, because it's the shapes of, as the eye looks left or right, the shape of the eyelid does change a bit as it's being displaced by the bulge in the cornea. Um, so if you can adjust those based on what you have here in your, in your target video, which you can't see at the moment because I have to relink that texture, but um, those, would be, those would be best. So essentially, you know, your position of the eye, eyelids, and then these little controls for the, co for the edges of the eyelids on both the bottom and, and the um, sorry, both to the left and the right. Um, from there, then, again, this is really if you have the time, um, I would probably try to do a little bit of a pass on these ones underneath, which are the sort of the cheeks of the, you know, the cheeks leading into the lower bags under the eyes. And then I kind of, you know, I, I take it here and there. Some of these ones I follow a little bit more than others, maybe like the ones that are truly on the corners of the eyes. But the rest of them, I definitely just pretty much run red nine on and more or less hope for the best. All right. Um, for the brows, it depends on your character, but I would be looking more at, um, again, the larger level controls. 
And there's not that many controls here, so I would probably, honestly, I would probably just track all, uh, just clean up all of them, just because there's not that many. Okay, if you are if you're working with a rig that has uh, an OSIPA set of controls, then you you definitely want to uh, clean up those OSIPA controls as well. All right. Um, this one here probably also a lot to work with for the brows. The cheeks, yeah, there's only a couple controls for the cheeks. You may find as well that the, um, I, I've actually left the nose off entirely um, just because I kind of find that even though we track the nose, it's not usually, it doesn't usually give me the results that I want. So it, the nose is a relatively simple region to animate anyway. It's only a couple controls and I can scrub through the video and I can see when, it, when my character is uh, breathing and not breathing, I can just really easily animate that by hand. All right. Um, so yeah, those are the main things that I would be focusing on at this stage. Are there any questions about any of that? No? Cool. Um, right. What else? All right, so in the number of auto poses, somebody asked, how many auto poses should I have? And the reason why they were concerned with the number of auto poses that they should have was because they were like, well, as I am retargeting things here, the face is not behaving exactly the way that it is in the video. And as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, it's not reasonable to expect that it will be a perfect mirror. So they had created like, 60 or 70 auto poses for the mouth. That's a lot. And I wouldn't recommend doing that. Granted, they did it in a way that was pretty decent, I will admit, better than I would normally expect. Um, but it is a bit overkill. And it's not going to necessarily limit them from ha still having to do cleanup. Okay, So it's kind of overkill at that stage. What I would say is that for the mouth region, I created somewhere in the range of like 20 or 22. Um, and it really is going to be dependent on the length of the animation that you're working on. Remember that for the majority of you, for everybody who is in New Zealand at least, um, your project is meant to be between 15 to 30 seconds. Okay, So you know, at 24 frames per second, that's somewhere between, um, what, did we, what did we actually end up saying that was? Sorry. I should be able to do this in my head, but I'm tired right now and I'm not trying too hard. Uh, so that's anywhere between 360 to 720 frames after you've converted it down to 24 frames per second. So the, if your animation is much longer than that, one, you're doing more work than you need to, two, you're not following directions, and three, um, you're potentially making it a lot more difficult for yourself because you, face wear is going to work better on smaller frame ranges essentially because it's, um, there's less chance of there being, um, of you having to introduce more data than you need to into the system. And sometimes introducing more data into the system can actually be counterproductive. All right, um, so. Make sure that you're working on exactly just the frame range that you need to be working on. And if that means that you pulled in a wider frame range from Analyzer or something like that into Maya, then just be working within um, Maya on the interval that you intend to use, but not the whole thing, okay? Retarget just poses within that interval. Now, um, so, like I said, I, I created somewhere around 20 to 22 auto poses for the, for the mouth. Um, half of those were actual auto poses, and the other half were manual poses. Okay. Um, I created, I think it was like 17 or 18 for the eyes. Again, it's about half and half, auto poses versus manual poses. And for the brows, I think it was something like six or seven. There isn't that much. You know, the brows have a certain kind of flexibility, but not as much variance as you're going to find in the other regions. Um, and the cheeks, yeah, there was a few poses that I created for the cheeks as well. 
but not that many. Um, so I use that as my guide. I usually say somewhere between 15 to 25 poses for the mouth is usually good. The eyes is often between 10 to 20. Brows is often between three to eight. Um, in my experience working with this. So take that for what it's worth. If you have created vastly more than that, ask yourself, how many of these poses that I've created are really similar to each other? If they're very similar to each other, then you probably don't want them. You'll want to keep whichever one is at more of a maxi maximal state. So if you have a difference between a character who's got their mouth, this is just a random exp explanation, but if you have a character whose mouth is like this, and you chose that, and then later on there's one where it's very similar but it's slightly more open, then choose the one where it's slightly more open, okay? If it's an otherwise very similar pose, okay? Radio. Um, somebody asked about relinking textures, right? And I recognize that this is a question that it can very easily come in. I mean, depending on whether or not you have been in digital design or if you're from another, pro another uh, program here, um, you may or may not be as familiar with Maya in this regard. So um, just really quickly here, following up on that, I just want to make sure I have the folder that I need in order to be able to do this. So I'm just looking for my textures. So um, for, for Daria, for instance, uh, not Daria, for uh, Amanda here, for instance, what I'd want to do is, um, you'll notice that selecting the geo, in this case, I've turned off the selectability of the geo, but I could. Um, these are layers that I made, by the way, so these are not necessarily the same layers that you would have in your scene. But if you are able to select the geometry, great. You can turn off the um, template or reference modes down here. If you're able to select the geometry, great. That's one way to do it, because you, what you can do is hit Control A to go into the attribute editor. And all the way to the right-hand side, you will finally see a materials node. In this case, it's called body. However, if that's not something that you can do, or if you prefer to do it another way, you can come into just the hypershade itself by clicking on the little thing that looks kind of like a magic eight ball up here by the render settings. And that will open up the hypershade. And currently, it will dock it up there as well, apparently. Um, so in this case, what I want to do is um, I don't necessarily need to try and find Amanda's shader. I just need to go in to find the textures, the textures tab up here. And the textures tab will show me all of the nodes that are associated with um, file textures. So file one here, in this case, is actually the body texture that's linked to Amanda. Um, when I click on that, I'm opening it here in the little attribute editor. And it's basically saying, here's the current path to that texture. But because I'm on another computer now, I have to relink that. So I can click on the little folder icon next to that and go and find the same name file, but where it is currently on this computer. So in this case, it's on my desktop. It's under this maps folder and body texture.ping. And it will reload in, and there she is. Okay, So now I have those textures. Same thing is true if I was trying to reload the texture on um, this image plane, which is um, the performance. Now, I don't know if I have this one with me, but that here is linked to the, this face wear Amanda shader within the color section, the color um, attribute. The little icon here that looks like this indicates that there's a node plugged into it. Click on that, it will take me to the node in, in question. And if I, let me just see if I actually have this one with me, I'm not sure if I do. I 
don't think that I do. But what I would do is I would just go and find the first, um, the first image in that 24 frames per second list. Actually, I think I do have that in there. Hold on. I do. Yeah, it's right here, actually. I just have to unzip it, that's all. All right, so I go and I find that here on my desktop. Um, just the first image in that list will be fine. And it loads it in. And now there we are. Does that answer your question regarding that? Cool. cool. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention, um, just out of curiosity, which, which rigs is everybody using? Rig. Amanda. Amanda? Amanda? OK. Who, what's that? All right. You guys are all making it very simple for yourselves. Uh, anybody not using Amanda? Right, OK, well, doesn't that make life easy? OK, uh, this is the Amanda class. Um, now, uh, I, I, I think Amanda is the, probably the most flexible of all the rigs, which will make what I talk about later a little bit easier. Um, but for those of you who are watching this, if you're watching this as well, um, there were some people yesterday who I was talking to in class who were having some difficulties with um, creating the proxy skeletons for some of the other rigs. And I just wanted to quickly mention the philosophy behind the choices that you make. So for instance, there were some people who were working with Jerry. Um, and I'm just going to open up a separate copy of Maya here so I can demonstrate this. Because what I talk about Jerry applies also to any of the other rigs. This is a little bit of a rehash, but I felt this was kind of important. Because um, it can get confusing, especially if you are not familiar with rigging at all. Which, how many people here, by a show of hands, are really not familiar with rigging at all? All right, so admitting, admitting practically zero n rigging knowledge whatsoever. It's OK. All right, so everybody else here are rigging experts? All right. So what? Who here has a slight knowledge of rigging? All right, and wh what, what about the rest of you guys who aren't raising your hands at all? What, what, what rigging knowledge do you have? No. So why didn't you raise your hand to begin with? <laughs> didn't want to admit, and we're just trying to put everybody into solidarity with each other to say nobody knows, and that's fine. Um, okay, so, and I just wanna make sure I have the right, um, So the, uh, the Jerry rig here, which I think is a very funny thing, calling it the Jerry rig, uh, since that's another term in, itself, in and of itself. Um, if we want to see the joints on this, it's going to be the same issue that we ran into um, in the Amanda rig. I'm just going to go ahead and turn off the geo, just so I don't have to see that. But if I try to see his joints, which the joints are currently enabled, you'll see that they are invisible because they've turned off the bone display. So remember last time we took um, this wonderful little script that I found for you uh, called joint draw style, All right? Let's drag that in here to my script editor and run it. And that's gonna give me this menu. Okay, so what I need to do is select all joints and turn them to bone. Ah, oh, bam, okay. Now, the issue with a rig like Jerry is he's got a lot of bones. He's a bony man. All right. Um, so which, which of these bones do you follow? Well, ultimately, when we think about 
what we want the proxy rig to do. We want the proxy rig to be able to bend in the same locations that our rig is going to bend and preserve the proportions of our rig. So when I go into this, um, if I go in and I go to my rigging tools and I choose skeleton, create joints, okay, there are a certain number of joints that I need to have. Um, and then there are, you know, because I, I think about in terms of the actual setup in the human IK setup, there are a certain number of joints that need to be there. Um, but the locations of them is up to me. So for instance, if this is, I, I, the philosophy behind this is you want to put a joint wherever there is an animation control that does some kind of rotation. So here around the hips, there's a hips control. Rotates around the hips. Obviously, I want to put a joint there. The other joint I wa want to place is going to be um, right here at this mid torso. And then there's going to be one up here at the chest. So those are all going to be good locations for joints. However, if we think about the human IK setup, the spine in human IK requires a little bit more than that. So there's going to be the um, spine or the hips control or the hips joint. There's going to be a spine. There's going to be a spine one and usually a spine two and a spine three. So I can't get away with just three, but I could get away with five, which means I could put one here. I could put a joint in between them, put one here, put another joint in between them, and then put one here. Right? So let's start out that way. Let's go ahead and just say um, one. It doesn't really matter exactly their locations here, because I'm going to move them anyway. Right? So let's create those five there to begin with. So bam, pop that one in there. Move this one around a bit. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna, I am going to be a little bit nicer with myself with the way I create these joints. Um, I'm going to hold down Shift while I do this, and that way at least they're staying in a straight line. All right. Okay. Um, so V to snap it to that joint there. Uh, this one here, do I want it right in the middle? Well, I guess we could. There is no great midpoint here for this, so I'm just going to kind of put it like right between those two joints there. And then I'll snap this guy to where he belongs here. Throw this one up here toward the midpoint again, and I'll grab this guy and snap him up there. All right, so that already is starting to give me something. Now, for the, for the rest of this, what I'd want to do is he's obviously going to need a, um, a neck. So there's going to be this neck control up here, right? And then there's going to be the end of the neck sort of right there. So I'll just go in, pop these two in there for now, and then we'll just put them into place. Pop that there. And then the end is going to go right at the end. All right, and that seems to fit right there at the end. For the arms, same deal, all right? We want to have, there's, there's going to be controls wherever there is um, a rotation. So we have our clavicle, we have our shoulder, we have our elbow, and we have our wrist. Those are the four things that we need. Um, so we have to find where is the clavicle? Where does, that, where does that rotate from? And if I grab my rotation here for the clavicle control, okay, it's this joint right here, all right? So I'm going to do this. Um, I'll lay them out from the top or from the side here. And so I'll just say, go ahead and create joints, insert joints. Um, something's, why did the head rotate there suddenly? Something weird happened there. I'm not going to worry about it, but something weird happened there. It's not going to affect what I'm doing. Strangely enough, however, I don't know what's going on there. Okay. Huh. Very odd. Stop doing that. <laughs> Every time I click the insert joint tool, I'm getting this weird error. I really have no idea why. Stop doing silly things, Maya. OK. 
Okay. Um, at this point, when it's something starts doing this, I tend to usually restart Maya, but um, I think there's some kind of error that's happening in the background. Anyway, what I would do in this case, just to give it a brief explanation, is I would create four joints for the arm, and then I would go into a top view, show ortho top, sorry, panels ortho top, and then I would use the top view to align them to the shoulder, to the elbow, the joint that matches up with this control here, and then to the joint that matches up with the wrist control. And repeat that same philosophy for the legs, right? So top, knee, ankle, and then the two joints down here on the feet, as you can see from the side. All right. Um, and then repeat that over here. Then just make sure that at the end that you select your hips, select your joint, and then hit P to parent so that they get connected together, so that they're all a single skeleton. Then you have your proxy rig. Remember, you need to name all the joints in your proxy rig correctly before you export it out so that you bring it into Motion Builder and it can be characterized. Um, but that will work for you. And that will work for you um, with any of these rigs. The, um, somebody had an issue with Malcolm. They're like, I ran, I ran the joint script and it still didn't show up. Well, the main issue was because they hadn't gone through and like in Malcolm, by default, joints is turned off in show. So they weren't seeing it because it was turned off in show. So make sure that that's on if you're not seeing them. Um, if you are having any issues with any of the other rigs, let me know. Um, I helped somebody yesterday with the, uh, what script, it, which one is it called? Um, Ray, help somebody with Ray. Um, and yeah, so the only rigs that I've seen people using so far are Amanda, Janine, Jerry, and Ray, and one person that I know using Malcolm, and I think maybe one person using Mary. Um, so yeah, those are all things that I'm uh, happy to help with if I need to, but hopefully you can also start to figure out on your own as well. Right, okay. So the major thing that I wanted to talk about today is uh, something a little bit different from all this, which is how do we start dealing with that body data that we have um, retargeted onto our character? And that involves having a little bit of an introductory talk about um, animation layers, okay? So as I look at what's happening to Amanda in this scene, and in fact, I will go and get Amanda's um, textures here real quick. Okay. Um, there's two things that I'll need to have. One is I will want to have the video reference, the video footage from the performance. That's that four camera reference that we have from the performance, or a three camera reference in some people's case. Um, because I'm going to need to know a few things about where the performance, uh, like what she was actually doing in the performance. Of course, the major issues that we're having here is what well, you know that Amanda as a rig has very different proportions to Daria as a human. And that's one of the reasons why our um, Amanda's arms are interpenetrating and whatnot. If we were animating Amanda just as a, as a standard character, we would probably be moving her around a little bit differently if it was just a pure animation. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the visibility of the joints at this stage. Um, so, we need a way to clean this up, but we don't necessarily want to disrupt the underlying data. We don't necessarily want to change the data that's there. If it's been cleaned and if it's not, you know, if it doesn't have a noise or anything in it, we want to preserve that underlying movement, but we need a way that we can edit on top of that. So who here has ever worked with animation layers before? One sort of hand, all right? Um, and 
so animation layers is going to be basically our way of dealing with this. And let's talk about that. By the way, as I watch this, you can see that here she starts with her T-pose, and then she goes into her clap, and then she goes out to her performance. So what I'd really want to do is to find when does this body data actually match up with the beginning of the true performance, which remember the performance, as you can see with her face here and whatnot, her face starts into her performance right from the start, right from frame one, because that's where I had the facial performance starting from. So I need to be able to take the body data and move that back to start at a different time. Um, I will need the video reference to help me get that right, but I can try doing it in a very loose way right now. So if I go in here, and I want to grab all of the controls that are currently associated with the body. Let's just go in and turn off um, the geo. All right, so I'm going to drag a selection around all of those, and I'm going to drag a selection around all of these. Uh, what I want to avoid doing is dragging a selection around anything that deals with the face, because I don't want to move the face around. I want to make sure I get all these controls. All right, so everything up to the neck, basically, is what I want. So I'm just holding down Control and Shift while I do this, just to make sure I get all that stuff. But leaving all of these other controls associated with the face on their own. Um, I'll also want to grab this head control. All right, I should have everybody there. If I go into my graph editor now, uh, Windows Animation Editor's graph editor, you can see here are a bunch of curves. Presumably, I have them all. So um, there's a couple ways that I could do this. I could go in, I could just grab all those curves, hit W to be in my Move tool, and I'm just going to I kind of put this on my other screen usually, but I think what I'll do for now is I'll just try to dock it down here. Um, I would have to know more or less the frame that the body is supposed to start with. So let's just say that the body, I know that the animation starts more or less probably here at, let's just say 200, just to make it nice and simple. This is, I haven't actually truly decided on that. I would need my video reference to help guide me, but let's just say it starts at 200, okay? So I have all of these selected. Um, I could hold down shift and middle mouse click and try to drag all of my frames down 200 frames to the left or to the right. Which way am I going? I need them to go to the left. Yep. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to use uh, a little step here in my um, in the values section, the stats section of the graph editor. So this is where I would normally type in a value if I wanted to manually adjust it. What I can do is I can type in, um, I think if I do this right, minus equals 200. Okay, so that has, has moved them, however, hasn't moved them in the right direction. So that, what that's done is that's moved it in the y direction. I want, actually want to change it here, maybe in this one. Minus equals 200. There we go. Right. That's basically moved everything 200 frames earlier. That's, uh, that, that was the frame number one. That's where I should have done that instead of the value one. Right. Um, so now when I go back here to this frame, frame zero, I'm starting at what, oh, come on. I'm starting at what was effectively frame 200 in terms of the body data, but it's now matching up with the beginning of my performance, which is going to probably make a lot more sense. All right, so it's approximate at this stage, but that's the easy way that I would do that. Um, okay, so that's not too that's not too rough, right? That's pretty straightforward. You do really want to make sure that um, you have everything selected, though, because what you don't want to do is is like only move it for certain curves and then the other curves get left behind and now your body's like moving at two different rates in different spots. And that's why I drew, that's why I went in and I drew selections around things. I didn't just grab like that. If I just grabbed 
an upper level control, it doesn't actually select the controls underneath it. They are highlighted because those are children, but it doesn't mean that they are techni technically selected here in the graph editor because as you can see, it's only that one control that's being selected there at a time. So dragging a selection will ensure that you actually get all of those individually selected. All right, so what to do about um, managing animation layers. Well, what is an animation layer in general? It's probably easier to kind of show this and demonstrate it to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open up my, gra my timeline to be about 200 frames earlier. Right, I moved everything down. I remember, I shifted everything down 200 frames. So I'm going to start my timeline at negative 200, just because it is nice to have that T pose there sometimes when I want to select things. And turn off the geo real quick. The major issue I'm seeing with Amanda at this stage is her arms. I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to create an animation layer just for her arms. So I'm going to select all of the controls associated with the arms. And I'm also going to select these little controls, these little flags at the end, which are sort of the, the finger controls and also like the IKFK switches and all that stuff. And normally, down at the bottom right corner of your channel box, you're dealing with display layers. But you also see a tab that says Anim. And if you click on that, you'll get to the Animation Layers section instead. So with these controls selected, what we're going to do is we're going to come in here and create a new layer from Selected, that which is the little button to the far right of the Animation Layers panel. Okay, and what that's going to do is means that just these controls, selected controls, are now associated with this new animation layer here. What it does is it creates a base animation layer at the bottom, which means that's where all the existing animation in the scene sits. And then there's a new layer on top of it just called right now Anim Layer 1. I'm going to change the name of that by double clicking on it to just Arms. So what I can do now is if I wanted to, if I play through this, you'll see that the arms are moving around like normal. But let's just say that I wanted to create an offset. Maybe instead of Amanda's arm being where it is right now, I wanted it to be rotated up like that. Right? Okay. Of course I don't, but this is just for the sake of example. Um, I will need to hit S to set a key there, because it won't just set automatically until I have set at least one. This is, by the way, with the arms animation layer selected. Okay. And you'll know which animation layer is selected based on whether or not it is green. It has a little green sign next to it here in the animation layers menu. All right. And so now as I play through this, all of the animation that was there is still preserved. It's just being offset. And I could come in later and decide, OK, well, around about here, I want her arm to come down over here, intersecting here, right? So now she's still doing the same stuff, but it's just being offset. And this is really what animation layers do, is they build, they build offsets on top of the existing animation. And you can have huge amounts of, of these um, layered calculations, essentially. Um, so obviously, we don't want it to do that, but I'm just going to go in here and, and delete these out. All right. Uh, I'm just going to set these back to whatever their original values were, 0, presumably. Actually, this was originally at 36. There we go. Um, and now, for some reason, that's gotten stuck up there, which is a good question for why. So. Make sure that that gets properly keyed in there. Okay, so um, the what do we want to actually do with this? Well, when we get to the start of this animation, which is at like frame zero here, we want to have Amanda already in the right pose. Ultimately, I usually like to get her into that pose before the animation technically starts, but right now that's fine. There are a couple issues that's happening here. Because Amanda has proportions that are quite different to Daria, um, Amanda is really intersecting herself. 
And what that might mean in this case is that we need to be able to move some parts of her around in ways that we wouldn't normally move. So for instance, I might want to move her clavicles out a little bit wider. I don't want to move them out so wide that she starts to become overtly masculine, but I probably want to move them a little bit and I might want to rotate them up a little bit as well. You can also see that her arms are intersecting her hips, so we wouldn't expect that to normally happen either, which means that we probably would start her out with her arms at least more like that. All right, so at least there's no intersections. Okay. Um, and what I would want to do is I'd want to go back to that reference performance and see how much distance was there really between Daria's arm and her leg here? Were they actually touching or were they, um, were they a little bit, was there a bit of a gap? And I tried to preserve that as much as possible. I'm not looking at that performance right now. This is more just sort of off the cuff sort of uh, cleanup. The other thing too that we have with Amanda, um, which I think is a bit of a limitation of the rig and something that I would prefer to go in and, and actually probably create some custom fixes for is that there's a lot of interpenetration between the arm and uh, the side of the body here. One way to try to fix that, is this, is an this is imperfect, would be to go in and take the spine control here and scale that in a little bit. However, you'll notice that scales in both sides at the same time, which means that if she only had one arm down, then it would be a little bit weird that the other side is scaling in at the same time, and also is squashing things, but it's not squashing them properly. It's squashing them with volume loss rather than volume preservation, because it's just like it's actually getting rid of the chest as opposed to pushing it outwards in this direction. Yes, you could technically sort of do that and scale it out this way, but now it's scaling her back as well, and that's a little bit weird. All right, so, you know, I wouldn't expect that to happen, okay? Um, so I would probably, if I really wanted to go in and do a good job of this, I would probably actually create, to, I would probably do a little bit of work on this rig itself and um, see what I could do about creating some custom controls just for the, for the dress itself. Um, I'm not sure, there might actually, that being said, are there custom controls for the dress that I'm not aware of? And there may be, in which case, uh, this may have already been dealt with, and I will probably just want to see if I can find those. I'll come back to discussing those momentarily if I do find them. Um, there is another control up here, worth pointing out, just f for, it may be of some very minor use. Um, I did not name this, this is not my rig, and I don't know why it was named this way, but it's called Bobble. Yeah, Bobble is not Bobble. Bobble is something, obviously, else. Um, it is, this is primarily to be able to provide a little bit of overlapping action. Um, but what it doesn't really give me is much control. Like, it will push in a little bit here, but it's not doing anything to the dress. So that's a little bit limited as well. If you want to take up, if, if you have an issue with that naming, which I don't blame you if you do, take that up with whoever designed this rig. Um, so, um, all that being said, I'm just trying to basically try to find a good, what I consider to be a good position overall for those uh, clavicles. And so this is, a start, this is sort of a starting point, right? And I will make sure that I hit S on all of these. In fact, what I will do actually, right at frame zero, is I'm just gonna right click on the arms animation layer, choose select objects. That way all of the controls uh, associated with that layer are selected now. And I'm just gonna hit S to make sure that they're all keyed in. Um, I'll probably go in and I'm just gonna limit the frame range here um, I'll bring it down to like 200 frames or so. And as I would go through here now, I would just take a look at what's happening with the arms essentially. Usually what I would do actually, if I'm really being truly honest, is I wouldn't start with the arms as my beginning thing. I would start with any offsets that I feel need to happen from the torso. 
working your way from the hips outward, basically, because anything happening in the hips is going to affect everywhere else. So if I can get the hips right, then I can move on to things like the arms and then the legs, etc. Okay. But for the sake of argument here, we're just working with the arms at the moment. Okay, so that's starting to look more or less okay. There might be, I'm not sure, if, no, no actual interpenetration there, so that's good. There are things, though, that I would want to compare with the original performance and say, hey, is there as much flexibility in the arms as I saw in the original performance? Okay, but at the very least, I'm just trying to make sure that there are no interpenetrations or weirdness going on at this stage. I try to work in um, smaller frame intervals just so I can more easily see things. All right, we might get a little bit of an interpenetration right here. Okay, so you can see that. So right up to this stage here, things worked pretty well. There weren't any other interpenetrations that I could see of aside from just this stuff happening here with the arms. Um, but right here, going to that, I would just say maybe at frame 230 there, I'll go in and I'll grab all of these um, objects again, hit S, and that's just going to preserve the same key that I had back on frame zero, because nothing's changed between then and, then and now. But now that we get to right here, where we kind of get to the maximum amount of movement, I'll probably just go in and grab this control and just pull it out slightly, just so it doesn't interpenetrate. I can kind of rest against it, but I don't want it to interpenetrate. And that way, you know, somebody watching this would never know, but I know that I've created the proper offset. Okay, and that's a kind of little bit of beginning cleanup that I'm doing with this. And that still seems to hold up pretty well right there, even at 305. And here going into some of these other, yeah, like probably hold that to right about 305-ish. Again, key them all, select all, key, and then there's a little bit of interpenetration that happens right about here. Small amounts of things, but just enough to kind of, oops, make sure I grab just the one thing. Just enough to pull it out slightly. Okay, um, and those are sorts of things that I watch. Now, that's just looking at the arms. What about the feet? The feet are going to have problems. If we take a look at th what Daria looks like by default, let's just go and open up a fresh copy of Daria. Not Daria, sorry, Amanda. Apologies. Actually, we don't have to open up a fresh copy. We can just look at this one. If we look at um, side view. Okay. So what we can see here is that there is um, the control that we see here, we have um, her flip-flop or jandal, um, and she has, uh, it's not, unfortunately this line is not right at the base of that jandal. Um, so what we can do here is we wanna create basically a floor, right? So if I went in here and I went and I said create polygon prim plane, and I'm just gonna drag this plane out a little bit, I'm going to pull it down slightly. And I put this right at the base of that jandal. Where does that sit? That sits at like negative 0.52, or just negative 0.5, right? Okay, so I can use that as a, as a basis for this. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to do the same thing. I go to my ortho side. And I'm going to go in and say create um, polygon prim um, plane. All right, scale this out quite a bit. And we'll put this down at negative 0.5. Okay, and that tells me that's where the floor should be. So that means that she is totally interpenetrating the floor at the moment, which is not uncommon. This, this happens, and this is where we also need to go in and do a lot of cleanup. So we're going to want to create an animation layer for her legs as well. So we'll just go to panels first. first. Um, 
I'm going to go in. I'm going to grab. Um, I'm going to grab the individual controls associated with her feet. So um, those controls, this control, this control, pull vectors, and the major contr uh, IK control there. All right, and we're going to go in and we're going to create a new animation layer here called legs. All right, I just sort of save along the way. And now what I'm going to do is, um, starting from frame zero, go back to the beginning. Let's go into our side view here to really see what we're getting. We will want to rotate this foot into position. So it's presumably flat, unless there is an actual reason for it not to be. Again, this is something that I'd want to check out in the um, original performance file, but I'm going to presume it's meant to be flat here. In fact, I'm going to take its rotates and set them all to zero. That's just a little bit easier way of doing that. All right. And then it's going to move this up so that the genital is sitting right on that plane. Now, where did my plane go? That's not the actual plane that I had put in there. There it is. Unfortunately, that's a bit invisible in here. I'm kind of surprised. I expected I should be able to see that. Show nerve surfaces. Is that a nerve surface? No. OK. Um, what could be more useful, perhaps, than this plane, if it's not showing up from the side view, would be um, to have it as, it could be a line, or it could be just a, a polygon cube that's just really thin. All right. So I might do that instead. Let's go in and create a polygon cube that's just really narrow. Something like that. And Put this at negative 0.5. I'm just going to really, really try to take that down to almost to just a line. Okay. That's probably good enough. So long as I give it some uh, some color here that will make it stand out a little bit. little blue color there. Um, OK, so this will help guide me in knowing where to put this foot. So that foot should stand there. This one, presumably, should also follow it. So I'm going to zero out those rotations and move that up a bit. So that's nicely locked in. Again, go in here, select objects, S the key. There we go. And now, at least, it's kind of a, looks like it's walking on water. Um, might actually change that color. Put it back to its standard gray color. OK, not sure why it's now decided to stay stuck on blue, but whatever. Um, there we go. Now, as she takes steps, we can kind of see whether or not those feet seem to be really staying in line with where they should be. But this is also some work for our graph editor as well. Right? It does seem like she's lifting up her foot here to put it back down. So that makes sense that that would be lifted. But the other foot is bobbing up and down and eventually goes up on a heel. That, that might be right. Again, I'm looking at my video to take, a, to take note of that. But this is something that I'd want to come into my graph editor and really uh, lock down and make sure it's stuck in place properly. Um, so there we go. Uh, if I go into my graph editor now, 
right? So the major thing that I'd be worried about on this foot is translate y at this stage, as well as any of the rotations that could potentially cause it to stop being planted properly. Um, so as I look at this, I say, all right, that should stay planted until at least it starts to move right there. So until like frame 20 at the very least. And I would go in and I would look at, um, well, if you look at your graph editor now, it's going to not be as obvious as it was before because now we have more than one set of controls visible at a time for a given um, animation control. We're seeing our keys for our legs animation layer, which right now has only one key on them. And then we have our keys for our base animation layer. All right. So our base animation layer here, we may need to be doing a little tweaking to. The base animation layer is where our mocap data is. So we actually want to come down to that. And that's the translate Y data that I probably want to edit here. All right. And as you can see here, over this interval, starting from frame zero, which is where I set the first key, there's a lot of up and down and movement around. Right? So at least until frame 20, I, want, I really want to keep that to be at the same value as at frame zero. So I would go in and I would just delete out these other ones and then just get this to sit there flat. Same thing true for these other uh, rotates. Right? So they may look innocuous until you sort of frame them up a little bit. You can see that they're not doing too bad, but there is still a little bit of rotation going on there. So again, until frame 20, I'm just going to hold that into, the, in, into location. Um, something I'm noticing right now, by the way, is that the tangent handles that I'm getting right here don't have editable um, well, they're not really editable tangent handles. And that's because their tangent weights are locked. And I noticed this happening to a number of people. When you bring data in, if you, um, sometimes when you bring the motion capture data in or even when you retarget, if you don't have the option for, under animation settings, uh, weighted tangents enabled, you may get this result. It's a very easy thing to fix. All you need to do is to go in and select the curves in question that you want to modify and go to curves weighted tangents. So if I look at these now, now I have, instead of those little triangles on the ends, I have these little squares on the ends, and they're now editable, which is good. All right, so I'd go in, I'd modify that, and then I would probably also modify this, this quick transition out of there. I don't have a problem in deleting some of this data so long as I know that I'm in control of what's happening. So the rotate Y, same deal. This is just something that you do to try to keep your things like your feet locked down. And if you don't do it, then you end up with things that are just jittering all over the place when they should really just be still. So now when I watch this foot going um, over that frame, that 20 frame interval, You'll notice that as soon as I get to frame 20, it starts to move. But up until then, it's nice and locked down. The foot's behaving like a foot, Okay, which is good news. There seems to be a little bit of motion in there somehow. I'm not sure what actually is moving. Um, might be, oh, you know what? Probably translate, the other translate, which I didn't account for. Um, so like translate x, I bet, I bet there's a tiny bit of movement going on in translate x. So almost imperceptible, debatable whether or not you'd have to go in and modify it, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. However, if you have a shot in which you cannot see the character's feet, you probably don't need to worry about this, unless the character's feet are visible in reflections or shadows or something like that, some other um, index of, of their presence. Or unless, their unless the feet are doing such weird things that if you can see their thighs, for instance, it makes the thighs look weird. Right? But if you, 
But if that's not the case and you can't see the feet, then you can often ignore having to do this. You really only need to work on the part that you can somehow see. And that's why it's also really critical when you're doing an animation to have figured out what your composition is going to be before you start doing a bunch of cleanup or even animation. There's no reason to animate something that has no impact on what can be seen. All right, so this is just the last little thing here I'll, uh, that I'll do, just to make myself feel satisfied with what I've done so far. Okay, and now that foot should truly be nice and locked down there, which is really good, it is. All right, um, if you have a character who's doing a bunch of walking, it can be a little bit difficult to track the walks sometimes. So I will, um, what I like to do sometimes is to create a camera that can track a walk. I just wanna see, does she walk much here? It takes a few steps. So if I, what I wanted to do is I, maybe I wanna follow those, those uh, steps a little bit more. I could create a camera that, um, new camera, camera and aim. I just think camera and aim is probably fine, yeah. All right, so perspective, camera one. And this camera here, I'm going to try to get just to follow just this foot, for instance. And what I'm trying to do is to get it to follow this foot and almost behave like an orth orthogonal camera. So if I want it to behave more orthogonally, select the camera's attribute, and I'm gonna change its focal length to something very high, maybe like 200, okay? Um, that way, it's a lot flatter. And now, as this foot moves, if I just get this camera to kind of sit in the right plane, right there, as this foot moves, I can have it aim or just follow the foot as well. So um, I could animate the camera to, actually I th I'm just trying, I remember I did something like this for my PhD and I was trying to remember to what degree of control I gave myself versus just doing this manually. Um, I think if you keep it really simple, you can just keyframe animate the position of the camera. So for instance, if the foot starts to move there, I might just hit S to here to keyframe keyframe my camera's position. And then as it moves to there, I might just move it over here. All right. And I might have to adjust the, the speed of that movement. However, the character starts to um, turn in frame, what you might need to do is to take advantage of this aim control. So the aim control, if I come into a perspective view, a different perspective view, um, there is that camera that I was just working from. There's a little aim control here and wherever this points at, that's basically gonna control the rotations of the camera. So if I start this back here, and say, hey, aim, aiming at this foot, let's just have it start out pointed at the foot here, pointed at the foot here, and it's still pretty much pointed there. Um, However, if the character suddenly, or if the camera suddenly started to uh, need to rotate, let's make this camera a little bit bigger so we can actually see it. Something is really not liking the undos that I'm doing. Uh, okay, there's some draw issues going on here. I'm not sure why that's the case at the moment. Um, however, generally speaking, where'd my camera go?
I have no idea what's happened there. All right, anyway, generally speaking, um, the camera will orient and orbit around that aim position there. Something's going on here. I'm not sure why that's the case, but um, yeah. Anyway, um, that may be overly complex for what you need. It's just something that I've used in the past. It's just a way to try to keep track of the feet being on the ground more clearly, especially when the character starts to um, rotate as they take steps going in different directions. Okay, um, I think that's kind of enough here to get you started. Your first goal is to ultimately just make sure that the character's not intersecting itself, etc. cetera, um, to try to reposition and reproportion the movements a bit. From there, what we'll take a look at um, going into next week is how to then push the poses that we have to better fit the character's um, the fact that the character is stylized. The stylization of the character means that just the human movements by themselves on their own is often not enough to read convincingly. And um, the, sorry, let the cops go by, um, is not enough for the character to read convincingly. And so we often have to push it a bit more on a more cartoony character um, and that's, again, something that we can create animation layer passes for, right? And so that might be an animation layer pass on top of the pre-existing layers as well. So we can be using for different things. One thing I will point out, though, just um, as a point um, to make sure it's clear, if you watch this character move quite a bit, you'll see that even when she moves her legs around, uh, the pole vectors do follow, but they don't necessarily follow the orientation of the feet. So one thing that you will need to do is go in there and actually animate the pole vectors to make sure the knees are pointed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. That is a limitation of doing it this way, um, but it, that's not a difficult thing to do. It's worth pointing out, though. All right, so I'm going to stop the tutorial here. Thank you for uh, watching, and good luck.